Welcome everyone to another edition of Play It Through, an honest edition is Bill and Ted's excellent video game adventure, brought to us by LJN. Based on the Bill and Ted films, but even more so the Bill and Ted cartoon, Bill and Ted's excellent video game adventure has you doing some time traveling, trying to find some historical figures, and getting them restored to their proper place and time. And you get to play as both Bill S. Preston and Theodore Logan as they take turns, one in one level and then one doing the next level. So here we go with Bill and Ted's excellent video game adventure for the NES. After a short copyright screen, we then get to the actual main startup screen of the game, and really all you can do here is press the start button in order to go into the main game. Once you do so, you'll have a brief story before you actually get control of the game. The game consists of all these historical figures and phone numbers in this book. Basically what you have to do is scroll through the book until eventually you see one of the figures has a secondary number. This is when you actually can then enter that secondary phone number and jump to that particular world where that is the location of that historical figure. The game features lots of historical figures, and we have to rescue a good amount of them, though you don't have to rescue them all. The game only features six levels, so you must travel back and forth between these six levels in order to find each of the historical figures. And the levels don't change up every time you visit them. And actually, one of the levels is the exact same as the level we start off with, the medieval world. So you really only have five levels to travel through. Here you have the isometric view that you'll be seeing for most of the game, as this is where you actually get to control your character. In order to save a historical figure, you must find one of three different items. There are three item locations throughout each of the historical areas. You have to find them by jumping on weird spots. As you saw there, I made a big jump from the grass area all the way to that fence in the background, and I somehow found an Uzi. That's an example of one of the historical items. However, it's not the one that we're going to be looking for here. It goes with the historical figure that we first saw when we put in the phone number. Since we're trying to save Rembrandt during this stage, we're looking for a paintbrush. So we must try to find those three items and then return that paintbrush to him. Each of the worlds in the game has four items or baits for you to collect. These are the items you must give the historical figure. They are located in the same locations every time you revisit a world, so when we come back to this world later on in the game, and we will, these items will be placed in the same locations. You must find the correct one in order to continue. We'll get more into detail of the phone sequence later on. As you saw when we first entered the phone number into the game, you actually have to play a little mini-game before you actually get to the world. 
The main key with that minigame, though, is that you have three different shots out of the cannon at the end of that minigame. Whichever direction you hold at the end there determines where you start off in that world that you're traveling to. That little rock I jumped to just a minute ago contained the paint roller, the second item, and actually the item we need for Rembrandt himself. Once you have the item though, things are still going to get quite confusing, because there's also three locations that each of the historical figures can appear in. So every time you travel to the world, not only do you have to find one of the randomly placed items, you also have to find one of the randomly placed historical figures. Once you find the historical figure in one of those locations, you give them the correct item, and that's how you actually complete a level in the game. As you may have noticed, there's also random other people walking around in the game. Some of these people will hurt you, and other ones will actually help you. Ones that are standing still will give you advice and point you in the direction usually of one of the hidden items. You have the guys that will walk around slowly, and these are a little bit of a threat. If you hit one, you must pay a toll of one coin. If you don't have that coin, they end up sending you to jail. You also have the crazed jailer guys, and when they run into you, they instantly take you to the jail. The jails are located in one specific location in each of the worlds. When you're in the jail, you must use one of your skeleton keys in order to get out. If you don't have a skeleton key, that's the only way you can actually die in the game, and it's a game over. Located up here on this fence is the location of the third bait or third item that we have to collect in the world. Like I mentioned before, we already have the one we need, the paintbrush, but this is the location of the third item so that when you come back here later, you'll know that this is where you may have to check to find the item you need. I mentioned earlier there's three locations of each of the historical people in the game. These are also represented by the buildings that you must travel into. The buildings sometimes have actual two exits, the one you came into and then another one. Going to the other one will warp you to another spot on the map. Learning some of these warps and where they end up taking you can actually really speed up your travel along the maps. However, until you know how the maps are designed and where you're really trying to get to, they can really just be a nuisance and end up putting you on the opposite end of the world that you're traveling in. On this tree on the left side of the screen is the location of the fourth and final bait. Now that we have all four of the items, it's time really just to find Rembrandt himself and finally get out of the first level of the game. Here we're going to jump on this horse, and they have a couple of these sequences throughout the game, either a horse or as we saw earlier, a canoe. They're little fun little mini games that actually aren't bad, and if you're able to get farther into it, you're actually able to collect some extra shiny coins. Like I mentioned earlier, the shiny coins are used to help you out in order to buy some items, but more so also able to give to the toll guys, so you don't end up getting thrown in jail by them. You must have shiny coins in order to actually access the phone booth at the beginning of each level. So when you notice at the very, very beginning when we were doing the Circuits of Time minigame, which we'll get more into later, you actually have to use coins in order to actually access that and do that part of the game. Even after playing the game quite a lot, these maps still really confuse me, and I ended up drawing my own maps to help me out in order to find the locations of each of the items and the locations of the historical figures themselves. In here is one of those locations, and this time we find Rembrandt. 
Now we must select the right proper item that we have, which is we're selecting the paint roller. We give it to him and we blast off to the next level. After completing a level though, you must go back to the Circus of Time and get back through them in order to get back to the current age. The Circus of Time, as you can see, you control this little spinning dial, and you must put in the correct numbers of the phone number in order to make your way across. Really the key here though is just to make sure that you get to the very, very end of it. After a few seconds of it rotating in the final number, it'll then blast through the circuits themselves and then actually go off screen. After completing a certain amount of levels, which in the first set of levels is only one world apiece, you get a little cutscene with the Wild Stallions themselves performing a concert. As we continue more and more in the game, the concert will become much more elaborate as we complete more levels of the game, and this is kind of really your goal of the entire game. After completing the stage though, you then get back to your book. You must then look through the book again in order to find the phone number that actually is glowing orange below the historical figure, and that showcases what level you're going to be traveling to next. The thing is though, these places only have a certain amount of phone numbers. There's only six phone numbers really in the game, so that's how you tell what world you're about to be traveling to. This helps you out so that when you make it to the end of the circuits of time, you'll know what arrow to hold in so that you actually travel to the right point in that world you want to go to. Getting the controls down for the circuits of time will take a little bit of effort, and getting your exact timing down sometimes of where you want to send the phone booth itself can definitely be a pain. You have a few skulls laid out throughout the circuits of time, and when you land on one of these skulls, it ends up costing you one of your shiny coins. Here we're going to be traveling to the Wild West era of the game, so I just want to go center. When you want to go just straight, you just hold nothing at the end of the Circus of Time to go straight. If you hold up, you would take that upper path of the Circuit of Time, and of course if you hold down, you'll go to the lower path of the Circuit of Time at the end. Like I mentioned before, each of them take you to just a different starting location in each of the worlds, and I find that the areas that we go to and the ones that were recommended to me by a strategy guide these seem to be the best and quickest way to find all the hidden items that we need to find, as well as the historical figures. Make sure that you notice at the very beginning of the level, I jumped immediately to the left of the screen and found the first bait item of the game. That time it was the Holy Grail. That's not the item that we're looking for currently in this run. We're trying to save Cleopatra, and we actually found the item we need for her in the previous world, but we still need to find the baits here in order to get that item again, and that was the major credit card. As you can see, the world is pretty much the exact same looking, it's just some different items spread around, as well as a different overall color scheme. Of course, the enemies also change up from being medieval knights to Wild West cowboys and sheriffs. Right after you get knocked off of your horse, be sure to stand up and then jump over to the far left side. You'll be able to hit this TP and grab a bag of money, which is the second bait item that we need in this world. Once I've showed the locations of some of the bait items, I won't be showing the locations of every bait item when I revisit the worlds. After I get that second item, it's actually easiest for me just to get caught by a jailer and use one of my skeleton keys. As you can see, the jail puts me right next to the third bait item, which is the major credit card item that I need to find in order to give to Cleopatra herself.
Come down here and then jump in front of this TP, jumping in the exact right spot that you need to, and you'll find the fourth and final bait for this world. The jumping on the items in order to actually collect them is so tricky at times, that's a good idea of why a video like this can be helpful, just so you know the exact spot I landed in order to pick up the item, because I tried sometimes for like a minute or two jumping on the same spots over and over again, and then finally, just by moving a pixel or two over, I was actually able to pick up the item. Thankfully, we only have to travel back a little bit from where we were in order to find one of the locations of where the historical figure is located here, and this time we find Cleopatra, give her the major credit card, and we can move on to the next level. Thankfully, the circuits of time during the very first levels is not difficult at all. You have to move your circle, though, in the correct areas, though, that will really help you out as far as avoiding those skulls laying around. Later on, though, we will actually have to hit the skulls in order to unlock secret paths so we actually can make it to the right areas. Now we're back to the phone book, scanning through it trying to find the next phone number that we need. Happens to be Paul Revere. So we enter in the phone number we need and it's time to head to the circuits of time. Here's the first example where you have two pink skulls at the end of the area. You have to select the right pink skull, and when you do so, a new area of the whole time circuit will appear, and then you'll actually be able to go back to that, and be able to choose your path to finally exit out of here. We're going back to the medieval world, so we're holding up. You may have noticed the phone number was different, because this is the example of the second medieval world. Like I said before, there's six worlds, but two of them are the exact same, and this is the example of that. The people that you see traveling around, now we have some knights traveling around, are different. However, the layout of the whole world and the map is the exact same as before. We start off from going down just a little bit, jumping to that fence, and grab the first item that we can, and this time around, it's the fortune cookie. One thing I haven't mentioned yet, and we will be using later on because it can get really tough later on in the game because there seems to be a lot more of the toll guys and jailer guys running around, is you actually have four attack type items. I'm sure you've been noticing I picked up a few other random ones from time to time, such as cups of pudding. You have a limited amount of these attack items, but you have the cassette tape. By throwing that, it causes all the enemies on screen to dance for a short period of time. Easily the most amusing of the items you get. You also have the firecrackers. Throwing them will cause all the enemies to immediately run off the screen, trying to save you from some of the jailers. You also have the pudding, which I picked up a bunch of. You throw them on the ground. They're easily the weakest, I think, of the items because they just throw on the ground and everyone kind of investigates it for a few seconds. But they're still easily able to get in your way and you can still run into them. So, not the best item, but definitely good to use those early on in the game. The best item, though, and the one you always have the least amount of, is the highly dangerous textbook. When you end up using that, it destroys every enemy instantly on screen. 
there are extra ones of these items spread throughout each of the worlds, and their locations are always the same every time you revisit an area. So if you find the location of puddings, or dangerous textbooks, or firecrackers, and then you revisit that world later on in the game, be sure to check that spot again, and you should be able to find more of that item. The hardest thing though about revisiting the worlds honestly is even though you know the locations of all the items, it's finding also those same locations where all the historical figures are. And sometimes those locations are very far spread out as compared to where we're actually going to be traveling to collecting all the bait items. Unfortunately, the historical figure I'm looking for here in the second medieval world is a little bit out of the way, so I have to travel a lot of just walking and avoiding enemies as much as possible in order to find them. And this will probably end up being a common theme, especially when we get later on, because some of the locations of where these people are located can be really tough to get to, or just really confusing with the way the maps are laid out. Here is the location of one of the historical figures, and this time we actually find Paul Revere. Hand Paul Revere the megaphone, and you can move on back to the circuits of time in order to complete the stage. Now for the first two levels of the game, you only had to restore one historical figure. However, now that we're actually in these third and fourth levels of the game, you actually have to save two historical figures per level, so two for level three, and two for level four. It then jumps up to 3 for level 5, and 3 for level 6. It's when we start to get to the 3 in each of the levels that I really find the game starts to become a major grind, as I pretty much have seen all the worlds by then, have collected every item at least one time, and I just end up really kind of just wanting to get the game over with at that point. But we still have a little bit of ways before we get to there. We go back to the phone book here, looking through, and now we're going to be going to save Marilyn Monroe. Just like the other time circuits we've been doing, you have two skulls at the end, you must select the right one, which can be a 50-50 shot here, and then go back to that number so you actually can travel through it and go to the colonial world itself. Since we're going to that world, we're going to be holding down on the circuits of time in order to land at this location. As you can see, you have some colonial soldiers running around, some colonial people, so watch out for them as we make our way, starting off by going to the left or north or however you like to look at it. Locate it down here in this bush down to the bottom left corner, which can be a little bit tricky to actually see and jump to, we find the first of the bait items. This time it ends up being the rose, which is actually the item we need for Marilyn Monroe. When playing the game for the first time, take note of any open house you see. I would actually recommend traveling inside of those houses and just realize what's inside. Not all of them can be locations for one of the historical figures, but it'll give you a better idea of where those locations may possibly be. 
is actually really weird that some of the locations for these things can actually get quite weird. Jump over here and be sure to jump up to this fence and you end up finding the next item which ends up being a lawn chair. Probably one of the weirder of the items you end up finding as bait items. One thing you may find in one of these buildings is a house that has either Bill or Ted inside of it. And it's actually just them hanging out, they really don't know why they're there, you have no real help from them by talking to them. It's just kind of a weird thing that I guess with multiple time travels that they're just kind of hanging out together. You also have some little mini things you can do with some things to help you find some of the items or locations by doing some dialogue choices with certain people in each of the worlds, usually corresponding to what type of era you're currently in. If you're able to do all the dialogue choices correctly, you will end up getting a clue to one of the locations of one of the items in that world. However, if you already know the locations of the items, you don't really need to complete these dialogue choices, so I really won't be doing them in this run. As you've already noticed, sometimes you may have to walk for a very long period of time on the screen before you're actually able to get to the location of another item or one of the buildings. Here, I'm going to be using one of the items for the first time in the game, this time the cassette tape. And as you can see, it's definitely quite humorous to use and causes all the enemies to just dance around on screen. The music actually continues to play for a period of time, and you actually, for that time, any enemy that ends up appearing will also be dancing, but it doesn't last very long, and once it goes away, all the enemies just continue moving around like normal. Jumping down here to this bush, you'll end up finding another one of the historical items, this time the paint roller. Now, we've already dealt with the paint roller before and gave it back to Rembrandt, but all the items can respawn and reappear in different time periods. If you're following the video to try to help your way through each of the maps, I must apologize that sometimes my paths aren't the exact quickest through each of the worlds. I had a hard time at points trying to find out all the locations of all the items, and easily the fastest route to get to all of them, so sometimes I just have to wander around for a long time before I'm finally able to get to that next item. So just take some of the paths I take with a grain of salt. Inside this building over here is one of the possible locations for one of the historical figures. Unfortunately, the one we need is not here, so we'll just back out and continue along our path. Since every time you do this, the placement of that historical figure is different, you'll have to sometimes check every location they can possibly appear in in order to actually find them. Make a long jump up to this fence on the upper corner and you end up finding another one of the bait items. Unfortunately, no historical figure located in this building, so we must continue traveling here.
Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of music that plays in the game, so it can make a lot of the levels really boring just to travel through. When we're traveling up this path, you'll end up finding one of those canoes. Just like before with the horses, traveling through the water really quickly to do your best to avoid all the rocks, and if you see anything bubbling, try to run into it, because it contains one of the weapon items that you can use. After traveling for what seems like forever, we finally enter this door and we find the location of Marilyn Monroe. Be sure to select the rose in case you forgot what item by this point that we actually need it for. Give her the rose and then go back to the time circuits. Since this is the second historical figure we saved in level 3, we now actually get another little cutscene with the Wild Stallions themselves. When we get back to the phone book, we see that we're actually going to be saving William Shakespeare this time around. So, enter the phone number and you'll actually be going to the modern age, or at least the 1920s it looks like age, of the game. When you're able to make it to the end, the best place to go here is the up path, so hold up at the very end of the circuits of time. Travel left here and then jump on this rock in the middle of these two paths here in order to collect the first bait item. After you actually find that first bait item though, actually get caught by one of the jailers. Once you're in jail, exit out and then start heading to the south. This is the point in the game where it actually has a lot more jailers on screen at once, so it can be trickier to actually dodge and avoid them. So make sure you have some of your items and weapons available to you to help you out. When you make it here, make a big jump up to this fence here, and you'll grab the next bait item. Once you have it, jump back down to the past, you actually can continue on. The jumping in the game, as I really haven't talked about too much, is based on a momentum system. So, the more you're walking, the bigger of a jump you're going to possibly be able to do. 
Getting down the controls and mastery of the momentum is actually going to be pretty key because this will really help you avoid some of the enemies in the game. I always found it annoying in the game that when you land in the grass areas you end up falling down, but you may have noticed you actually can use this to your advantage as the enemies in the game can't travel onto that grassy areas, and that when you jump to them you'll be able to actually stay on them and avoid the enemy altogether. Now big open areas with all the grass like this, you can't avoid the enemy since you're able to walk on it, they can walk on it too. But any area you can't walk on, and you just end up falling down, they can't walk on either, so you have those little benefits that you can use. Traveling inside this building is actually the location of one of the historical figures, not one here this time around, but just go through the other exit and go to the other part. Travel down here just a little bit and jump on this rock and we find another one of the bait items, this time the stage prop. With all these jailers on screen, I'll once again use one of my cassette tapes and cause them all to start dancing around and I'll continue traveling down to the right. I mentioned earlier that I find it really annoying or boring that they don't have a whole lot of music that plays throughout the game. The music that does play plays for a short amount of time and then ends up stopping, and since you're traveling so much in these levels, the music ends up stopping way before you're actually able to get through a particular stage. Though I do find it cool and give credit for the fact that they actually used popular music and used some 8-bit arranged versions of them throughout each of the levels, such as Scarborough Fair, as we've heard, and Deep Purple Smoke on the Water, which will be coming up later on when we make it to the Ancient World. Just to the left of this path is the final bait item we need in this world, and that's from this tree. Jump in front of the tree at the right spot and you'll find it, which happens to be a compass this time around. Now that we have all the items, it's time once again to hunt down the actual historical figure, this time around being William Shakespeare, give him his items so we can move on to the next area. Thankfully, one of the historical figures' locations isn't too far from where we picked up that last bait item. Traveling up here to this building, we can go inside of it, and this time around it just happens to be where William Shakespeare is located. Give him the stage prop and move on to the next level. Be very careful when you make it to the end here that there's actually four skulls at the same time. Remember, you have to pick the right correct pink skull in order to unlock the rest of the time circuit so you actually can complete the stage. We're going to be saving King Arthur this time around, and he actually is going to be located in the Ancient World, the only level we haven't traveled to yet in the game. When you make it to the end of the time circuits, be sure to hold down and you'll end up landing here. This ends up being my preferred location in order to find all the items here. Start off by traveling down here and jumping to this rock and you end up finding the first of the bait items. Once you have that in your possession, start heading down to the south.
You're gonna have to travel a very long way down south here to the next actual branching path. And unfortunately, the music even ends before we're able to make it to that branching path. When you make it to the branching path, instead of continuing to the south, head off to the left side. Jump to this branch up at the top here in order to grab another one of the bait items. This time around is the Holy Grail, which is actually the item we need for King Arthur. However, then jump over the different trees right here to the left and then continue along the path. It should be interesting to note that this game actually came out in August of 1991, which is actually just a month or so after the second film was released. So the game is really actually based off the first film, as well as the cartoon which ended up coming out in 1990. So the game was actually originally a continuation of the story from the first film, having you traveling more throughout history, saving historical figures and all, but since there was actually the cartoon and the sequel film, you can really kind of just throw this game kind of out completely, and it really doesn't have to be a part of the overall story of Bill and Ted. Travel up to the north path here, and then make a big jump over to the left side here. You'll have to land in the exact right spot that it wants you to, but if you're able to, you'll find the next bait item. This time we end up finding a headstone. Unfortunately right here I realized that I actually am pretty much going the wrong path that I need to be going, so I'm gonna have to do some backtracking here to get back to the correct path I want to take. Just unfortunately one of those many mistakes that happens when the world kind of pretty much looks the same no matter where you're standing in it. Basically right now I'm trying to get back to one of the historical buildings, and this will help me not only see if there happens to be a historical figure there, but if they're not there, it'll also allow me to travel to another part of the map easier to get one of the bait items I need. Here's one of those locations of one of the historical figures, unfortunately not one here, but we're going to travel through the door here and end up going to the next area, which when we do so, right to the left of that is a palm tree we can jump onto for another one of the bait items. Traveling up this path just a little bit, we end up jumping onto the back of one of the horses, and we can ride along that one to get across the big area here. At any point when you're riding the horse though, if you hit any object, you end up getting knocked off the horse instantly, and you'll have to walk the rest of the way through this path. It's actually interesting that I end up passing one of the rooms I need to enter in, so I'm just going to get hit by this item as soon as I can and get knocked off right before the end of the path, so I only have to backtrack a tiny bit to get back to the building I need. Inside the building also happens to be King Arthur, so I'm able to give him his item and we can move on to the next level of the game and get another little cutscene with the Wild Stallions after the time circuits.
The next historical figure we're going to save is the outlaw Jesse James. We're traveling through the second medieval world once again, and so when you make it to the end of the time circuits, be sure to hit up on the D-pad so you end up traveling to the same spot we've been going to for all the other previous medieval worlds. We've now seen every world in the game though, and this is where the game really starts to get a little bit monotonous and boring. Since we've seen every world already and already traveled through them, there's no new worlds to explore. So it's really kind of just knowing where you have to go in each world and trying to get through them as quickly as possible, grab the items you need, and then get the heck out as fast as possible so you can move on to the next level. Start off by going south just again, jump to the fence, and grab the next historical bait item. It may look quite boring and I'll very much be running the same path through each one of the levels from here on out, but unfortunately, since I didn't see all the historical buildings, we may have to travel a little bit farther in each world than we did before to find some of the extra buildings I didn't go into to maybe find that historical figure in that world. Of course, also being an LJM published game though, it wasn't developed by the same company that also developed the Back to the Future Part 2 and 3 game, there's a lot of similarities, mainly of course the time traveling aspect, which makes sense since both film franchises were time traveling, but it also seems to be the same kind of monotonous moving around of finding a particular item and returning it to a particular place in each of the two worlds to make sure that you're actually able to move on to the next area. Released at the same time that this game was released, there was also a Game Boy game released in Bill and Ted's excellent Game Boy Adventure. Now that game was actually made by Beam Software, the same creators as the Back to the Future Part 2 and 3 game. And if you've ever played that game, you may notice that there's actually quite a few similarities between the puzzle rooms of Back to the Future 2 and 3 and the overall layout and gameplay of the Bill and Ted Game Boy game. I end up finding the Game Boy game a lot shorter, and since it is shorter with a little bit more variety, I end up finding that game a little bit funner to play than the NES version that we're playing now. But really not by a whole lot. Since we have all the items, we now have to actually find the location of the historical figure, and to do so, we're going to have to travel quite a lot in the medieval area that we haven't really traveled to throughout the rest of the game in order to actually locate them. Besides the Game Boy game, there actually was a couple of other Bill and Ted games released. There was one released for the Amiga and computer systems, and then there was also one released for, of all systems, the Atari Lynx. And unfortunately though, I've never played those versions of the game, so I really can't recommend them either, but I have a little bit of hope that they may be better than the NES or Game Boy games. And I have to admit that since Telltale did such a good job with the Back to the Future game, the point and click adventure game, I would actually kind of like to see the same thing done with the Bill and Ted franchise. Inside this room is Miss Fifi, and she appears in other random worlds throughout the game, so I figured I'd show one of her rooms throughout the run. 
And basically, she works like there's other NPCs that I mentioned earlier, where you can have dialogue sequences with them, and if you choose the right paths, you can end up getting a hint or two about locations of items in that particular world. Thankfully, located just a little bit to the right of her is another location of the historical figure, and we end up finding Jesse James here. We give him his correct item, which happens to be the Uzi, and we go back to the time circuits. We'll now be traveling back to the modern world in order to save Julius Caesar. Be sure at the end of the time circuit you hold the up button so you can land in the same place we landed the last time we came here. Just a little bit north or to the left you'll end up finding that rock between the two paths. Jumping on it will give us our first bait item this time around. And just like before we're going to get captured by one of these jailers real fast so we can get to another part of the map. Always be careful when you're doing the jailing sequences or being hit by the toll people that you have enough coins for the time booths as well as you also have enough skeleton keys so you can escape so you don't end up getting a game over. You wouldn't want to make it to near the end of the game and end up getting a game over near the very end. In case you are wondering, there is no save feature, but there is a password system, and the password will actually begin you at the beginning of a level, so the beginning of a set of worlds you can start off at. There are six total levels like I mentioned earlier, and you have to save one historical figure in level 1 and 2, two in levels 3 and 4, and then of course three in levels 5 and 6. Unfortunately, with the passwords though, they only give you to the beginning of the level, so you can't like save two people in level 5 and then use the password and come back and only have to save one person. You'll have to save three people again in order to actually advance to level 6 at that point. And here's a location of one of the historical figures, but not here right now, so we're going to be traveling through and just go to the next part. We can jump over to the rock and once again get another one of the bait items. Since we're saving Julius Caesar, we're going to need the salad dressing item in order to actually get the level completed.
You can probably guess at this point that the game definitely has started to get a little bit boring, to say the least. Traveling to these levels already for like the second time, and then eventually probably three times total before I'm actually able to finish the game, really starts to wear on you as you're trying to make it through and actually get the ending to the game. I really do feel maybe if they cut out levels 5 and 6 and really only have four levels of saving people, it really kind of would have helped the game a lot and made it a little bit less monotonous and boring overall. Even with a nice map to actually go by, it can still get confusing, and with the long travel times makes the game probably the worst. Even though I already will have some of the items I need most of the time, just trying to find that historical figure in later levels just seems to always take forever, as they always seem to be the last place I check. And it's levels like this when you actually can't find what you're trying to get to that really starts to wear you down when you're trying to make it. Thankfully though, we finally make it to the room where Julius Caesar is located. We can give him the salad dressing and move on to the next level. Next up, we're going to be saving Elvis. So enter the phone number and we're going to be going back to the Wild West stage in order to save him.
Be sure when you make it to the end that you don't press any buttons so that you go straight and end up landing in this area. I start off by immediately jumping up here and I end up finding the rose item which we had given earlier to Marilyn Monroe, which of course means it's not the item unfortunately for Elvis. Here I'm able to find an extra few cans of pudding to help me out as I'm traveling through the Wild West area. But the thing is, I have a good amount of items already still on me, and the other ones are a lot more powerful, so I'll use them up before I end up using the cans of pudding at this point. Jump on the horseback here and ride this along, watching out for all the items, cactuses, as well as the tumbleweeds, so that you can make it to the end and get a few extra coins. Probably at this point in the game, you may be starting to run a little bit low on your coins for the actual time circuits, so be sure to pick up any extra ones you can to help you out for the last few levels. Thankfully, when I'm able to land, I'm immediately able to go over to this TP, and I end up getting the headstone item. The headstone happens to be the item we actually need for Elvis, and I end up getting hit by one of the jailers, and it puts me right next to a, one of the locations of a historical figure, and we're lucky enough that Elvis ends up being here, we can give him the headstone and move on, and probably the quickest level we've done throughout the entire game thus far. Okay, we have only one full level left to complete. We're in level 6 itself. That means we have three more historical figures to save. Starting off first with, we're going to be saving Christopher Columbus, and he ends up going to the ancient world. When you make it to the end, we're going to be holding the button to end up going to the south path in the historical ancient world here. Thankfully, I have a really decent path of getting through the ancient world, so as long as I can locate the item for him relatively quickly, I shouldn't be stuck here for too long.
Unfortunately, though, we're going to have to travel a long ways here at the very beginning in order to make it to the next item that we need to collect. The maps are all, thankfully, kind of laid out the same here, so once you've started to learn a little bit about the game, the maps aren't too confusing. The problem with them is, is some of the paths you may take end up leading to dead ends, and since some of the paths look exactly the same as other paths, you may think you're on one path, but you're actually on a different one, and you end up bypassing items or locations that you need in order to actually try to get through that stage. Jumping up here, I'm able to find the compass, which is the item I need for Christopher Columbus. So now I just actually gotta find his location, and I can move on to the next level. Thankfully, I can stop by here and enter into this house right here, and there is Christopher Columbus. I can give him the compass item that we found and move on to the next level, and we have only two more historical figures to save in the game. The one we end up having to save is Robin Hood, and Robin Hood actually ends up going to the colonial times. We've seen Robin Hood's item quite a few times throughout the game, and his is the bag of money, in case you didn't guess. Just be very careful at the end here, though, of all the skulls. As you can see in the last set of levels, there's a lot of skulls near the end of the time circuits. Since we're going to be going back to the colonial world, be sure that when you actually get to the end of the time circuit, you're holding the down arrow. Even though we already know what item we need, and that is the bag of money for Robin Hood, we still may have to travel to all the bait locations until we're actually able to locate the bag of money item, so it still may take a while just to get all the items. Along the way though, if you see any of the buildings just like we've been doing, make sure that you check inside of them to see that there's a historical figure there, because if we end up finding him located in there, at least we can mark it down where he's already located so that when we find the bag of money, we can come back to him easily. But of course, usually with luck being a major factor here, we'll probably have to get all the item locations and then come back and eventually travel around the map a few times and finally locate Robin Hood himself. Here I'm able to locate the lawn chair once again. In case you're wondering, the lawn chair ends up going to Sitting Bull. 
and that's just in case we don't end up getting him, because like I said before, there, there actually ends up being more historical figures than you actually have to save, but since they're randomly placed every time you replay the game, you may end up getting Sitting Bull as actually your very first person, where I may not actually get him at all throughout the entire game. Unfortunately, there is no way to really speed up the game at this point, so it's just going to be a lot of walking around trying to find that last item I need and finding the location of Robin Hood. You can see that some levels can go really quickly, like the previous ones have really gone, but then you get to one where you can't necessarily find the item you need or the location of the historical figure real quickly, and it can take a really, really long time. Stopping by here, I'm able to find the Book of Lawyer stuff, which actually goes to Al Capone. Here's one of the locations of the historical figure, but unfortunately, Robin Hood isn't located here, so we'll just exit out and continue along our path. Stopping by here, we once again have another location, and unfortunately he's not here either, so we're just going to exit out and continue along the path once again. It can always get really frustrating when you finally find the location or possible location of one of these historical figures, and they end up not being there. Well, the way to get a new perspective of everything is actually getting caught by the Jailer. This may help you actually try to locate one of the areas you haven't been to already.
here, traveling in here, another location. Unfortunately, though, we're not here, so we're just gonna travel through the other exit here, though, so that we make it to another part of the map. After playing for a while and tracking as many buildings as possible, it may seem like it's hopeless to actually find the guy, but trust me, there's just one building you may not have checked already, like I haven't, and that will be the location of the person you're looking for. And trust me, when you actually do find them, it actually kind of is a big relief and you actually do feel good about finding them, at least I do. After traveling for what seems like forever, I finally go down this path, which happens to be the last location I think possible for one of the historical figures to be in. Entering inside this building, I finally find Robin Hood. I'm able to give him the bag of money we collected earlier on, and we can move on to the final area of the game. We have only one historical figure left to save. And the last but not least, it ends up being George Washington, and he ends up actually being located in modern times. For the medieval area, once again, be sure to hold the up button so you can make it to this area to start off with. Since George Washington famously had a set of wooden teeth, we're actually looking for a pair of teeth, or a pair of choppers, for George Washington. Hopefully we're able to find and locate the item quickly, and can also locate him without relatively too much of a headache.
Checking here, we find the paint roller, which actually was the very first item we ever needed in the game. At this point, though, you're probably going to be running low on items, so be very careful, of course, that you don't end up getting nabbed by one of the jailers, because you don't want to end up getting a game over during the very final area of the whole game. Also, you will need some coins to get through the very final time circuit after you actually save the final historical figure. So make sure you have at least a few coins left so you can get through that final time circuit. Here, we're able to locate the pair of choppers, which ends up being the last bait item we need in the game. So now all we need to do is find George Washington himself. Inside this room, unfortunately, is not the location of George Washington this time around, but we can use it to teleport to another point on the map. I have a good idea, at least thankfully, on possible locations of the historical figure throughout this map, so I'm going to start heading towards that now. We'll have to travel up here for a good amount of distance in order to actually find that location though. On the upper right path here, ignore the first open door. Instead, continue on, and the second open door on this path will actually be a possible location of a historical figure. Enter inside the building, and we're just lucky enough that this ends up being the location of George Washington. So we can give him the pair of choppers, and now all we need to do is complete the final time circuit in order to enjoy the ending to Bill and Ted. Be very careful since we only have a couple of coins left at this point in the game, so we have to make sure that we choose the right one here. Thankfully we had two left so we could have made both choices if need be, but thankfully we get it right on the first try, go through the time circuits and enjoy the ending.
So after the final concert scene, now with all the crowd there, you have some beach balls going, all the musicians there as well. You get a congratulations stream with a little bit of text. And there you go, that's the ending to Bill and Ted's excellent video game adventure for the NES. And with that amazing one screen ending, it's time to wrap up this edition of Play It Through. I'd like to thank you for watching, and of course, I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>